So um, hi, everybody. As you come on into the webinar, um, please just put in the chat where you're from. We always like to see where people are tuning in from. Um, it's been really fun. We've had people from all around the world. Um, tonight, uh, our webinar is with Dr. Joyce Harmon. Uh, jo Joyce is probably one of the premier holistic veterinarians in the United States. I met Joyce uh, in 1990, actually. Um, and I'm just going to give it a minute while people are signing in because we're up to 35 and I don't want to get started until um, uh, everybody's here. So as you're coming in, just, oh, somebody's raised a hand. It's a new message. Um, Joyce, just, uh, let's see, I got to get to everyone. Joyce, just say something so just so we know your mic's working and everybody can hear you. Hi, everybody. Welcome. This is uh, quite an adventure to uh, be talking to everybody from all over the world sitting at my computer. Yeah. All right, so we it looks like uh, it's kind of slowed down a little bit. So we're going to go ahead and get started. So um, I'm just going to do this. So I met Joyce in 1990 at the Old Dominion 100 Mile Endurance Ride in June in Virginia. And the reason I was there was that I was at a team clinic with Linda Tellington Jones, and she suggested that crewing and an endurance ride was a really great way to use your team skills. So at the time, I had, I'm not even sure how I met Bobby Lieberman. Bobby had done a lot of, she was at Equus Magazine and she edited a lot of uh, Linda's books. And uh, Bobby was doing the 50 miler. So I uh, wound up being as part of her crew and I was doing uh, teamwork on the horses at the rests. And um, we were at one, one hold and I looked over and this horse had fallen down. He tied up so badly. So I went over and offered the veterinarian my assistance and that happened to be Dr. Joyce Harmon. Um, we're celebrating 30 years of friendship. She's uh, been in her practice for 30 years. And so it's just my pleasure to introduce you to Joyce and I'm going to like turn it over to her. Well, it was, it was an amazing event meeting Wendy because at that point in time, tea touch and team were kind of like voodoo medicine and I was kind of into voodoo medicine and I still am today. So, um, but back then we were really considered, uh, let's just say odd. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and so it was to, I knew about, I knew Linda and I knew, I uh, knew about the tea touch. And when Wendy appeared, I was so relieved because I actually had somebody who knew about this stuff and that I could kind of turn over some of the work to. And because I had to be involved with the sort of veterinary side of it. And if I had stopped being a veterinarian and been a voodoo person, that might not have gone over quite so well. But um, I could in bring Wendy into the team. So, so that from that point on, that kind of started our friendship and we've hung out ever since. We used to go so, up to Connecticut. As I recall, Joyce, we stood there for two hours with that horse and you ran uh, like 20 liters of fluid. Oh, we were probably there for four to six hours. Oh, you know, okay. That's, we, we got, yeah, we were there for a long time. We got to know each other quite well. Because uh, I know it was kind of like, uh, um, and we saved the horse. That was the thing that was the most yeah. important at the time is the horse lived, which was really amazing and uh, awesome. So at the time and, I was living in, oh, go ahead. Truthfully, the reason the horse lived is because of the tea touch because knowing, knowing what I knew as a veterinarian, this horse was really touch and go. So it was the T-Touch and Wendy that really helped save the horse. So it was a cool beginning. Yeah. And um, at the time I was living in Connecticut, so I was a good six to eight hours away, um, but I started coming down to Virginia and I had another friend here in Virginia, um, Margie Youngs, whom I knew from when I had lived here before. And so Margie would have me come down and do workshops and then Joyce started having me do some uh, riding clinics at her place. And so then I'd come down and spend a couple of days, do a riding clinic and go back to Connecticut. And um, so we had this kind of friendship for a long time. And then on 4th of July, I don't know if you remember what we used to do on 4th of July, um, I would have oh, girls yeah. <laughs> 
And I'd get a whole bunch of my friends to come up to Connecticut and we'd go into New York and we'd go have fabulous dinners and go to plays and go to craft shows. Um, one time we even actually uh, went up to Nova Scotia. We caught the Blue Nose Ferry. I don't even think that's running anymore. Um, and we went up to Nova Scotia to Alga Camos and we rode Icelandic horses. So that period of from 1990 to 1999 was a lot of um, sort of keeping in touch and my coming down, it was really hard to get Joyce out of Virginia <laughs> to come up to Connecticut. <laughs> um, but I didn't own any horses at the time. And so Joyce kept saying, when are you gonna move to Virginia? When are you gonna move to Virginia? Um, and finally I decided I wanted to get a horse and she, she said, you could keep it at my place. So that's what we did. <laughs> I moved to Virginia. Um, and I actually you have- Virginia. Uh, Oh, you kind of camped out in your horse trailer for a little while. I, I did. I bought a horse trailer and I camped out in my horse trailer, but um, I'm just going to, so this is Andy and um, this was my first horse post uh, hiatus when I moved to Virginia. And um, so that's Joyce's barn and um, he was just a, a delightful horse and, and it started with one, right Joyce? <laughs> And then it kind of, uh, yes. it went to Multiply. two. Um, and actually there was another one in there. Um, and then it kind of, actually that's three, but there was four and five that kind of came and went. So um, Joyce was really good. She told me that this one had to live downstairs in the lower paddock, but he never spent a day in his life in the lower paddock. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, but Al's still there and I'm just down to one horse and, um, and he's an awesome guy and I really love him. So, uh, Joyce, tell us a little bit about your practice and what you do. Um, basically, if it's voodoo, we do it. Um, so I, I started with acupuncture, studying acupuncture back in 1990, around the time I opened my practice here. And I guess that makes me one of the um, kind of one of the old farts in the industry now. Back then, acupuncture and chiropractic weren't very well accepted. I used to sometimes get paid in cash because nobody wanted to confess that they were actually having somebody do this stuff on their horse. Um, now that doesn't happen quite so much because it's much more accepted, and and people will even tell their veterinarians that they're having me work on their horse. Whereas back in 1990, it was kind of, you know, don't tell my vet, you know, I, it's, you can be here, but don't say anything. So the world has progressed and I have learned a lot. I started with acupuncture and chiropractic. I added, studied homeopathy. I, uh, let's see, I, after studying homeopathy, then I started getting more and more into herbs and Chinese herbs and Western herbs. And so it's been a, a learning progression. And truthfully, this alternative medicine is, is a lifetime of learning because there is so much. There is no edge to the box. You can get as sort of far out as you want um, and you can stay as grounded as you want, but there's something there for everybody from, you know, some people feel animal communication is a little bit far out, but actually animal communication can be really helpful. Sometimes those horses know a whole lot more about what's wrong with them than we do. And they can, so everything can fit together. We can, I, I get to spend a lot of time with the horses where in conventional practice, it's kind of you run in and you run out and here I get to really take the time, get to know the horses. Many of these horses I've known their entire lives from the time they were very young. And now some of them, including my own horse, I have to, I, I'm not even sure I can quite confess to how old she is. She's 23 or 24. Yeah, you got her shortly and, um, after, I think I have a picture here that uh, I can uh, show you your horse. Oops. Where's my photos? They're down here. Let's see. Here she is. Here she is young. It was <laughs> <laughs> yes. And Wendy used to come down from Connecticut and she helped me break her because she was two years old when I got her. And uh, 
So any of the mistakes that I made were mine, or I could possibly blame Wendy, except that she only came down periodically. But it was it was really with Wendy's guidance that I was able to get her going, and and she's she's a really cool horse. And of course, she um, she has taught me a lot, and continues to teach me a lot because. Of course, now that she's 23 or 24, and I've spent half my life treating everybody else's horses with things like um, laminitis and Cushing's and PPID and all those good kind of things, guess what? She's a Connemara thoroughbred. So what is she? <laughs> she is fat. <laughs> she tends to eat too much. And she tends to get a little bit of laminitis lately, especially this, this winter I got kind of carried away taking care of my mom and not giving her all her supplements. So she, and, and she was sat there and ate on the round bale. So she ended up with a little bit of laminitis. So just like everybody else, I have to, uh, I have to deal with that. No. And it's hard when we have sort of major life events, like, I, you know, I'm very aware of what has been going on with your mom. And when my mom, came to live with me and um, had to be in assisted living, it's easy to get sidetracked into what at the time is more important, um, taking care of our, our family. And, um, and sometimes the horses get a little, they can slip a little. So it's what's really nice, Joyce, about you. And one of the things I've always appreciated is that you're, you're right there with us and you're really down to earth and you're, you know, you're not, you're, you're one of us, if, if that's the way to describe it, um, um, very approachable. So um, basically, uh, once I moved down here, one of the things that we started doing, let me see if I can find that picture and I'll screen share it, um, is Joyce was seriously into um, saddle fit. And Joyce, what got you started on saddle fit? Um, I got started with saddle fitting not long after I got learned about acupuncture and even before I learned about chiropractic, I just, I kept noticing that some of the horses that I went back to see were, they seemed to have issues in the same places all the time. And, and I didn't think it was just because I couldn't get it with acupuncture. It was because there was, there was something else going on in these horses' backs. And, and I ran across a saddle fitter at a barn one day and um, got to talking and, and it, it really piqued my interest because it made sense because the places that I was having these recurring pain issues that I couldn't seem to get rid of were underneath the saddle. And so I started really looking at saddle fitting and then along the way, I was blessed with meeting Andy Foster from England, who was a friend of Wendy's, and who really, truly understood saddle fitting. And I began to study with him, or every time he came over, I was just like a sponge, because he really, truly understood the horse's back. And he used this device to measure the horse's back and then build a saddle that was truly customized instead of just kind of coming out and putting a couple of tree, a couple of trees on and building a saddle that might or might not work. These saddles really worked. And so it just became, it became an obsession of mine. What can I say? Yeah. <laughs> and I became determined to write a book about it and put all of that information down then I was blessed to meet a Western saddle fitting person, Blake Crow, who taught me everything about Western saddles. And one day I actually got um, Andy Foster and Blake Crow together. And guess what? Fitting a Western saddle is the same as fitting an English saddle. Yep. And, and actually, I remember when we had the two of them in the same place, because that's when Blake measured Andy for my Western saddle. So yes. um, there's Blake there with his wet black hat. You can't really see his face, but that's him. <laughs> and uh, so I, I started writing this book and I remember very clearly, even on one of our, on our trip to Nova Scotia, 
I was writing the book, sitting with my little ancient laptop, which probably had a whole 100 megabyte hard drive back in those days, maybe a 200 megabyte hard drive at that point. And uh, so I wrote this book for probably 10 years before it, the first one finally got published. Yes, because when I met you, you were definitely doing things like this, and here, here you are. Here's and that other picture that I showed first was a pressure, uh, uh, the picture of a pressure using a saddle fitting tool. And here's Joyce in Botswana with me in 1999. And uh, technology failed us that day. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, so Joyce's obsession with saddle fitting was well before 99. And she, when does your book get published? What year? Well, the book was published in 2004, so I started working on it in 1994, 1995, because I remember counting up, and it was about 10 years that I actually spent writing it. And by the way, and you've got some this is Joyce here. She's usually behind the camera, so I don't have a lot of pictures of her in front of the camera. <laughs> um, but this was in Botswana. And this is a baobab tree. Remember that? Yep. And so I had this, this, one of the tools that I used to help learn about saddle fitting was this pressure sensor, sensor pad that Wendy showed the picture of. And that was what we were trying to do on this elephant was to measure the pressures underneath the saddle on the elephant. And unfortunately, yes, technology, we know all about technology, it still fails just to the key moment. So we didn't get pressures underneath the saddle, but we did get to ride an elephant and yep. that was pretty cool. And that was really, really cool. So these are African elephants and they're, um, you have to handle them really carefully. And so it was quite special to be able to go there and saddle fit this elephant. Um, and after we left, the, the princes came in. So this was a, was a pretty big deal. Um, and they had, uh, is that you there? I think so. I can't. I can't tell. It might be but the they had it, the elephant was a bit lame, as I recall, and they had to. Uh, um, they were concerned about the saddle. So, um, so your saddle fitting. And, and it was really, really, really Go ahead. Go ahead. It's. I'm just reading the chats here. So you. Um. It. I just thought. It was, okay. It was really cool that the people who were with the elephants were interested enough way back then to, to think about the elephant welfare and the fact that these elephants, maybe they did have some pressure sores from, or maybe they were a little bit sore from the saddles. And the people that we were actually riding the horses with in Africa were, um, at that point, we're also interested. That's one of the reasons we had the equipment over there was that they were interested in learning how to do a better job with their saddles for the safaris. Yeah. And Wendy so, has taken that whole, the whole African um, thing and runs these regular safaris over there, which are a blast. Yeah. Yep. So um, I've been going to Kenya now for the past 10 years. So Joyce, we've got a question for you. Um, somebody has a horse that's had anaplasmosis. So we're going to go a little bit to, to questions here. Um, and he's still on Doxy and Tickex, and he's still stumbling when she rode him and just started minocycline and will be continuing Tickex and colostrum. And she's just wondering if there's any additional homeopathic therapies that she can do with her horse. Um, with anaplasmosis, one of the things that you probably want to do is look at some blood and make sure that they haven't gotten really anemic um, because the anaplasmosis can, in the chronic state, can sometimes leave them with um, a little bit of anemia. So you're going to have to build up some strength through that. And you can sometimes, you can do that with, you don't want to do that with things like red cell. You want to do that with some blood and chi building herbs. I use some Chinese herbs for that. Um, but you can even use th simple things like nettles, which have a lot of, they have some iron in them, but they have a lot of nutrients that are good at building blood. Um, and there, and somebody's actually asking, what do you recommend for treating anaplasmosis? That's been a common question in a couple of the webinars I've been doing. 
Um, anaplasmosis in the acute form, a lot of times it's a high fever. And so your main homeopathic remedies would be something like belladonna and very often five days of doxycycline and you're pretty much done with it. It's the chronic cases that need some attention that's maybe only usually 5% or so of the cases. And um, for those I use, um, I, I have a Chinese formula that I use that builds blood and, and qi, the Chinese energy of qi, to build some strength. Um, it's in the chronic form, it's not one of those simple, oh, here's a remedy that makes them better. Unfortunately, the beauty and the curse of holistic medicine is we all want the silver bullet. And truthfully, I want the silver bullet. I want to just be able to say, here, take this remedy and you will be better. And it just doesn't work quite that way. Um, different horses will have different symptoms. And if you're looking at, if you're looking at sort of stumbling or weakness, very often that is going to be more of a chi or a blood deficiency where the, and they actually can be anemic from the anaplasmosis. So in the, the commercially available, the Tic-X aftercare is a bit more of a chi tonic. So you might want to focus a little bit more on the aftercare aspect of it and definitely checking in with the blood to see where you're at, to see if that is the problem. Sometimes you have a lack of platelets and you have to really build those up. And occasionally some of those I, I use some other specialized herbs for. But that is the curse of, of holistic medicine. There isn't for some things, there's, there's things that work cons fairly consistently, but for the complicated horses that don't respond initially, then we have to really kind of tailor things to them. And, and that's, so I, do telephone, I do telephone consults to help people sort those, some of those things out. Yep. Um, and so somebody's asked about your muzzle. So that's kind of a little later in the story. That's a more recent thing that you started to do. But tell us how you got into actually building a muzzle and a little bit about your Harmony muzzles. Well, I think the muzzle actually, I can blame on Brad. Yeah. As, <laughs> Brad's as, my guy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> as you were starting to work on the Surefoot, Brad came and said, you know, you could just, you could build a muzzle. It would be really easy and it would be, you'd be able to put this together really cheaply and you'd be able to make some money. Thank you, Brad. <laughs> I'm sure he's here. So in the, the, uh, he said you're welcome. <laughs> in the end, it was not really cheap to put it together. It's um, to find the, the right kind of plastic that's actually moldable at a safe temperature that you can mold and shape to your horse's face, which was the idea. Um, it turned out to be a very expensive project. In the end, I'm glad I did it, I think, most days. It's, um, it's a great contribution to the horse world because it's, I wanted something because my horse is insulin resistant, obese, and eats too much. I needed a muzzle and the first time I put on the big typical black muzzle that everybody uses, she in one day refused to speak to me and she would hide in the back of the stall and present me with her rear end. That was her opinion. So I had to, so I was importing a muzzle for a while and then that got difficult and then Brad came up with this brilliant idea. So I followed that through and she she doesn't really mind the muzzle anymore she and many horses that's what they say is they really don't mind wearing it they aren't you know it's not their favorite thing of course but it they don't object to it and it's so important and, that these ir horses are muzzled because it's it you always talk about eating chocolate yeah so you know you can go out in the pasture and you can eat chocolate and if you eat too much chocolate, we all know what happens. And so 
at the same time, if we confine these horses into a small paddock, they don't get exercise, and more importantly, they don't get socialization, so they actually are more stressed. So for most horses, the muzzle is a way for them to be out and be more interactive with their friends and get a little bit of exercise. I've met horses that will not wear a muzzle at all. I've met horses that destroy every muzzle that's put on their face. Um, and some of those horses you just end up having to confine. And that's, you know, we have to save these horses from themselves. Just as I would probably have to be saved if you put me in a, well, I don't think Hershey's chocolate would be my thing, but um, <laughs> if you put me in a nice organic dark chocolate factory, I would need a muzzle too. Yeah. And, and so we often actually did projects together, not intentionally, but it just worked out that way. Um, my starting Surefoot at the same time you started the muzzle and also writing the books that, um, you know, I, our projects, somehow we always seem to wind up on similar projects at the same time. It was more coincidental, mm -hmm. but it always seemed to happen. So someone's asked if you could talk about uh, how to use, about the use of acupuncture and chiropractic and Surefoot in the treatment of sciatic pain. Ah, that's an excellent combination. So the key with sciatic pain is that what you've got is lumbar tension. It, it's the sciatic nerve comes out in the lumbar vertebrae. Oh, I might be able and, to show a picture of just a little bit. Hang on. This okay. is from, uh, you'll recognize this picture. Because um, that's, that. see that t-shirt right there? <laughs> That's very similar to the t-shirt you have on, yeah. right? And you were just making a connection from the hoof uh, through the, the um, deep digital flexor and all the way up into the uh, psoas. Do you remember that? Yes, yes. So the psoas, the psoas muscle is a big muscle that is going up underneath the spine. So that what you're seeing on top of the screen is the tail, tail bones and right. the backbone. And then underneath the spine is the psoas, and the psoas definitely crosses and is, is in close relationship, actually, to the sciatic nerve. And yep. any so tension in that... It's just the, the, pick, the body, the rear end of the horse you're holding is in the opposite direction as the model below. So the psoas is going to be, if, can you guys see my pointer? It's going to be here on the underside of the, the uh, lumbar and going down and hooking onto the lesser trochanter on the inside of the femur. And it's the, it's the muscle that if you watch your farriers stand up after they've been shoeing for a long time, it's really tight. And then when Wendy says, open your hips and your hips don't open, that's the psoas. So, so the same thing happens with the horses. How many times people have horses where you pick up their hind legs and you try to stretch them and they're really stiff. So that is all, all parts that are related to the, the lower back, the lumbar area. So you've got the muscles on top of the lumbar, you have the, sp the lumbar spine itself, which we all know, especially if we are aging horse owners, how the lumbar spine feels on us. And the horses have the same lumbar tightness and tension. And if that gets to be too much, you can end up with sciatic pain. So sciatic pain, the most common presentation or the most common reason that you see sciatic pain is, or the, the most common way you see it, is that you have, um, you pick up one leg like I was picking the picture or just picking up a leg to clean the foot or more importantly, trying to pick up a leg to uh, shoe it. And the horse slams the foot down that you just picked up and actually picks the other foot up and, and unweights it. That usually means that you have a sharp shooting pain down the opposite leg. So you're picking up one leg and you think that it's, that's the bad leg but a lot of times it's actually the opposite leg that the horse is feeling that sharp shooting pain. In the upright human, you feel the sharp shooting pain a lot of times when you're walking. 
in the horse, it's more prominent when they are standing and you pick up a leg and you torque that lower back. Because if you watch the lumbar area, as you pick up a hind leg, it has to twist, it literally twists. So if you go back to that picture, Wendy, you can maybe see it a little bit. And just where the, the gluteal muscle and the hip rises, now you can't really see it there. Yeah, you can kind um, of see that everything's a bit on an angle because you can see the angle of this yeah. leg here. Yeah, and you can see the fact that the, that the um, leg is, the the gluteal part or the 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 hamstring part of the leg is being lifted up and out yeah and so the whole pelvis tilts well in tilting the pelvis you have to put a torque on in the lumbar and that's when you are that's when you see the worst part of the sciatic pain so in order to treat that it's very difficult to start with stretching because they can't stand on the, the leg that has the shooting pain. And you can have it on both legs or you can have it on one. So doing chiropractic, mobilizing the joint, there's many different terms that are used for mobilization now. We have chiropractic, we have osteopathy, we have spinal manipulation, depending on where people studied. But the idea is to get those joints moving properly so that that sciatic nerve is not not being is not stuck it's not being um impinged upon i don't really like the term pinched but that's because it's not a correct anatomical term but that's essentially the feeling that you're that the horse is having the acupuncture can actually um relieve the muscle spasm portion because the spine itself if if you put a pile of horse bones on the floor you get a pile of horse bones if i put giraffe muscles on the horse bones it's going to look more like a giraffe kind of a weird looking giraffe but a giraffe if i put horse muscles on it will look like a horse if i tighten some of those horse muscles then those bones can't move freely so what we want is free movement of all the joints in the body so the the chiropractic, the, um, you can see the lumbar muscles behind the saddle in that particular picture. And, um, and these, these were, just as a, a little aside, um, I had taken a course way back in the early 90s of building a horse from the skeleton out with clay. And then I introduced that to Wendy, who jumped on it and thought it was fabulous and ended up um, teaching. And I think you still have some of those yeah, classes occasionally. Yeah, I have occasionally. field models and, I, and one of these days I'll start teaching it again. I was actually thinking about doing something with the Zoom meetings and building out a model on Zoom. So um, well, that would be really cool because yeah. you can, when you build it from the skeleton out, you really get to see how the muscles lay because most of the time we're looking at it from the outside and we really don't know what goes on close to the bones. So um, we, we, did a, we did several of these classes together and then Wendy started teaching them and, and it's, it, for me it was just a fabulous learning experience to really see um, John Zahura, where the muscle is. The man who created the whole idea of anatomy and clay. Um, we, I did my first one. I think it was '99, and we had Sue Harris and you and Hillary Clayton and Andy Foster, and then later I organized four courses. So that they're, they were just really powerful. Yeah, it's an it's an amazing way to learn anatomy and really understand a horse. So, um, so we get back to our sciatic pain, then. Once we have loosened up the spine and the muscles so that the spine can stay moving, then we can begin doing some of our own stretching. The nice thing with use incorporating Surefoot into that is that you, you very often will still have some resistance to picking up that leg. And when you go to pick up the leg and start to do some stretching and the horse feels a little twinge of pain, they tighten up the muscles that you've just 
paid the chiropractor and the acupuncturist to loosen. If they can get on the sure foot themselves and they can move around, they can go into their swaying pattern, they can release the tension. If they need a short time or a long time, they can spend that. They can, they can take over some of that tension release. And so if you, you get the body work done to get set things in motion, then you. Oops. Your audio just cut out. Then you'll be able to get to the point where you. You're back. Keep going. Oh, did you lose me? For a sec. Oh, okay. So what was, what cut out? Just, just getting using the pads and putting the horse on the pads and letting him readjust so then you can then you can oh then you can start to do your own stretching because the horse at that point is comfortable and can handle the stretching when they slam their foot down you cannot hold it up and so and you can't force that and the sure foot is the, one of the best ways around that that i know of Cool. So um, someone's asked if you use dowsing rods. I, I personally am not good at that, but I have plenty of, you know, I think it's, it's totally valid. I have a 50 gallon a minute well because I used um, a friend that had dowsing rods. And um, across the street, I had a 1.5 gallon a minute well without dowsing rods. Well, and, but it's and, a total way of working if that's what you're comfortable with um, there's another question about uh, doing blood work and whether or not it's a value uh, on checking health and similar blood work like we do with people like an annual physical um, yes and no blood work if you use that as a data point um, and you don't try to decide to treat everything based just on the blood work it can certainly be a nice thing to do sometimes as your horses start to age there goes my pussycat um as horses start to age it's nice to have a baseline so you 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 can look at that and say three years ago or two years ago you know everything really was normal and then if you get into a into a crisis you can certainly go back and compare it to that is it something you have to do every year no i don't think so if your horse is basically doing well if it's something that makes you comfortable there's no harm done to the horse at all and so the harm sometimes comes from looking at things like Lyme titers because Lyme titers can be high in a perfectly healthy horse because their immune system is, is dealing with it. And we don't want to go treating these healthy horses just because they have a, Lyme, a high Lyme titer. Nor do we want to go and treat a horse who appears to be slightly anemic with something like red cell, which usually makes them kind of hyperactive and doesn't really they aren't usually iron deficient they're just running with a slightly lower red cell count than some other horses i'd rather give some herbs or some nutritional supplements at that point so if you can take your blood count and put it into all the rest of the data you have with your horse then it's fine if you're going, if you're the kind of person that they, you see one thing that's a little bit out of line and you feel like it's got to be treated, but your horse is doing beautifully at whatever sport you want to do, then maybe you shouldn't take blood quite so often because it'll make you crazy. Um, do you think there's value in the stem cell therapy? The stem cell therapy for, um, for tendons and ligaments? Uh, they haven't specified, but probably. Yeah, that's, that's most of what it's being used for. Absolutely. That, I think that that's actually kind of using high tech to actually encourage the horse's body to do the healing. And I don't use it myself, but I do refer a lot of horses to it because I do think that it enhances healing. However, having said that, 
there are also many tools that we have in our toolbox that can heal tendons and ligaments that some of which are things like homeopathics that cost an entire $15 for a bottle of Rutagrav and all the way up to some other treatments like this transdermal CO2 that I've been working with a little bit that's much pricier but can also heal. We also have a lot of herbs that are really reasonably priced. So if you can't afford something like the stem cell treatment, but you still want to do something more for your horse's tendons, there are lots of possibilities. Yeah, and she apparently she's asking about rebuilding cartilage in our in cases of arthritis. Yes, I do think that has some validity. And it's not going to work in every single horse, but um, I, and I'm not super familiar with which cases to select for rebuilding cartilage, but I have definitely seen that kind of um, treatment succeed. Absolutely worth considering. All right, so we have a question about what kind of stretches uh, would you use? Um, you can you can stretch your horse everything from picking up a leg and making some leg circles for 30 seconds when you first start to spending 45 minutes just slowly stretching your horse out in every direction possible. The key is you never force it. You always wait for the horse to release and then make your stretch a little bit bigger. Because if you try to force a stretch, then you, the horse is going to pull back and guess what? they're stronger. So you haven't accomplished anything except actually increasing tension. So if, um, if you want just a simple pre-competition stretch, make some, do some leg circles while you're tacking, before you're tacking up, cleaning out feet. And if your horse has a particular area that's a little bit tight, then spend some extra time, do a little bit of shaking, do a, little, do a few small circles as well as big circles. Try to really loosen that spot up. And so we have somebody that's, um, that's raised their hand and I knew it hand raises. So um, I'm gonna allow her to talk and we're gonna see what her question is, okay? Okay. All right, Sarah, what's your question? Sarah, are you there? Sarah Irwin? Oh, I have to unmute her. Unmute. I'm learning how to do this, okay? Uh, unmute. I can't seem to unmute her. All right, I'm going to ask her I'll, to just I'll handle it in the chat. I'll try. Oh, wait, did we have a voice? Sarah? Let's see. Unmute. It's not working. All right, I'll just have Sarah put it in the chat. I'm still figuring out some of these things. So um, now I have to make sure you have your voice back. Am I speaking? Yep, you're good. Is it? I can hear you. Okay. Um, so I'm still learning these, the difference between webinars and meetings and raising hands is something I have not figured out yet. <laughs> um, but I'll just put it in the chat there and see if she can ask her question that way. Okay. Um, yes, yeah, so all this technology is, it's, it really is pretty amazing, but it does require a learning curve. Yeah. And, uh, and it's been a big one for me this past week. I can feel my brain hurt. So I know what my students are going through when I ask them to do something non-habitual. And that's exactly what I'm going through right now is a uh, little, little brain pain. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> Building new brain cells. I'm really happy about that. Um, so um, somebody was asking about their horse has an old rope injury around the neck and she tends to hold it very stiff. Have you worked with anything similar to this and what would you do? Oh yes, um, the, the old rope injury itself, if there's a lot of scar tissue, um, the homeopathic remedy silica given a couple of times a week for a month or so really helps break down the scar tissue, but also get your hands in there and you don't have to have fancy training to just gently begin to kind of work on that scar tissue. 
doing stretches, neck stretches, carrot stretches, and absolutely most of those are going to need some kind of chiropractic and manipulation because they've usually have damage to the to the tendons and ligaments that are right next to the spine. So they're they are stiff and they really need um, need need it worked out, but they usually respond really well. Yeah. So um, somebody's asking about loosening muscles and tendons and how how then is the fascia involved? But maybe you could talk to about that in relation to using surefoot pads. Um, loose, loosening up muscles, tendons, lig excuse me, muscles, tendons, ligaments, and fascia are all they're all completely connected. And so you can come at the um, loosening up, stretching, lengthening, whatever it is that you're after from so many different directions, depending on what your training is, depending on what you have access to. So using the surefoot is using the horse's skill. And the horses are pretty smart about rebalancing themselves and figuring out how to release. And a lot of times, a lot of us don't have manual therapy, massage type of skills. And, or you might have, you know, you might be good at massaging somebody in your family, but you look at a thousand pound horse and you have no idea where to begin. The surefoot is kind of saying to the horse, go for it. You, you know how to do this. And so they really can release and you watch them and you watch all the videos that of these horses that are, they are processing the, the information that the surefoot gives them in a way that we, we really can't duplicate. So it's, it's a way of accomplishing an awful lot with actually very little extra knowledge, if you will, of body work. So someone's asked what your muzzle looks like. So I'm just gonna screen share here because I've pulled up um, pictures of your muzzle. There you go. Yeah. And so and, um, uh, are they coming preformed now or are you still having people form oh, them? Yeah. Yourself? Yeah, okay. Now everything is everything is preformed. All you have to do is put it in some hot water or get a um, a hair dryer, eighteen hundred watt hair dryer, and you can bend and um, mold it to whatever shape your horse's head is. So if you have a horse that's got a really wide nose, or you have a horse that has a really a wide upper head and a narrow lower head. You can bend the corners out. You can, um, you can basically shape it so that there are no rub spots. And you can add, you, if the horses are trying to cheat through it, like my horse likes to cheat through one corner and only one corner. So I can put a zip tie on that one corner and the rest of it is, is loose and free. And you can cut out and you can cut out the holes in the bottom so that you can tailor how much grass that they actually get. So if they are, if they really need restriction, you can have the center hole and one other hole. Most of the time I recommend two holes in the bottom. If you're trying to let them eat off of the hay bale, you can actually open up all the holes and they can still get to a hay bale, not quite so well through a net and a muzzle, but they can eat on a, on a round bale and they can eat some hay if they have all the holes cut out. So it's really adjustable. All right, so we've had another question of what type of supplements do you recommend for senior horses? Especially a 29 year old <laughs> that's hard to keep weight on. <laughs> um, for senior horses, there, there's a lot that we can do. The first thing is to make sure their teeth are in good shape or that they have teeth or find out that they don't. And horses that don't have a lot of teeth can be kept for years on a kind of a sludge made out of hay, hay pellets and grain that is soaked. You can add, if they need extra calories, 
one of the best things to do is to add some fats because if you think about how many calories per bite there is in fats and you know how good they taste so you know what happens when you eat a lot of them then that's what we want to do with some of these senior horses is not have to just keep feeding more and more grain because that's just going to shoot through their stomach small intestine and then go ferment in their large intestine and not really be digested properly so we can um we can give them increase their fat content of what they're eating and we can also when we start to talk about supplements simple things like flax if they have some teeth or chia seeds um, for the omega-3 or hemp seeds and we're finally able to actually get um, hemp seeds i should have some hemp seeds on the website shortly that we can actually get in bulk now and so we have um, we can use simple things like that we can absolutely add some vitamin C, we can need some probiotics for horses at that age. A lot of times their gut is not processing as well, particularly the ones that are losing weight. We can also, sometimes we need some enzymes so that as they get to be 29, 30, 35, those are our 90 and 100 year old people. So they need a few enzymes in order to help digest their food. And so you can get some enzyme types of products for them. Supplements, we're always looking at things for their joints, things for their arthritis. Um, I also use a lot of hemp and CBD products for horses because those are anti-inflammatory, they help support the immune system. And uh, it's kind of a great old horse tonic type of a of a product. Um, curcumin or turmeric can also be that way, but you have to watch a little bit with turmeric because it can be a very warming and somewhat drying herb. So if you live in parts of the country, like in the high mountains in Colorado or, or high dry places, um, curcumin is not such a good supplement. Here in our damp country in the Virginia, it can be a great supplement because it's anti-inflammatory, it supports their immune system, and, um, and is a good kind of old, old horse tonic, if you will. And beyond that, there are, there's lots that you can add depending on what that individual horse needs. Um, so let's talk about laminitis since we're coming into laminitis season and um, somebody's asked about a product remission, but I think you should also talk about your, your mare and how you use the Surefoot pads to help her with this recent battle laminitis. Yes, um, and I don't know if I can, don't know, did I send you that picture? Can you find that picture on your computer and I can. share it? I can't seem to find it. Um, so my horse got some laminitis this winter and it was from standing there eating round bale nonstop 24 seven and me not able to give her her supplements every day. And I have a, a supplement called OB formula and one that's a little stronger called INR that are both really, really useful, but you do have to feed them. And, uh, that what was happening to me was that I wasn't getting them fed every day. So she got some laminitis and started to get a little bit tender. She'd never got a really hot foot, but she was definitely not comfortable. And she actually had a little bit front and back feet, hind feet and front feet. So what I did was make sure she got her supplements every day. I put her on some Chinese herbs and I put her on some Surefoot. I mean, I put her on the Surefoot pads because Wendy kindly brought me one. She said, you need to put your horse on some Surefoot pads. And my horse said, yes, thank you. Yeah, I actually so have a the, of that. So I'll go find them. Yeah, pictures. Um, because the first night, I think she stood on them for, on the slanted pad for like 20, 25 minutes. 
The next night, she stood on them for an hour and a half. And in that time, Wendy moved her horse in and out of his stall. We were hanging out in the barn, kind of talking. The lead shank was dropped on the ground. My mare did not move. Finally, she kicked off one of them and stayed. I was ready to go get my computer so I could do some work because she was not moving. She wanted to be on that pad. And so that was the second night. She, um, the third night, she stood. I was all prepared. I had my computer. I was ready to, to put my feet up and work. And uh, after about 20 minutes, she said, I'm done. Walked off. Didn't want them anymore. The next night, she had no interest in them at all. And in that time frame, she got significantly better. There's no question that, um, that she was more comfortable immediately after standing on them. And her choice was to stand there for a long period of time. I can't find them. So then recently, of course, the spring grass is coming out. And I've been feeding her her supplements faithfully, but she has other ideas. And every time I look out, the other two are still kind of hanging out with the hay bale. Every time I look out, she's out on the little bits of spring grass that are there. And so she's starting to get a little tender again. And so I, last night I put her on the sure, night before last I put her on the sure foot pads. And she stood on two of them. And this time I was actually, cause I didn't have a ton of time, I was grooming her removed half of a horse from her body. And she was just still sitting there. And then she, two thirds of the way through the grooming thing, she kicked one pad off. She kicked her left front pad off and just stood on the ground and kept her right front on. I had no you know, Lee Chang hanging on the ground. And she walked off much more comfortable. So oh. last night I stuck her on the pads and she uh, said, eh, they're okay. And really did not have a whole lot of interest in them. So to so this me, was the, that was, was in a January, these pictures, Joyce, when the, the mm -hmm. first time. And see so the Lee Shanks hanging out on the floor and we walked around, you know, she played with me a little bit. We moved horses. Wendy went out and brought her horse in. I think you actually turned him back out. Yeah, and, she didn't uh, go anywhere. He never, and she, he had to walk past her. His stall is down there on the right. He had to walk right past her. She had no interest in leaving. It's mud all over her head, by the way. Yeah, it was, it was um, January. That's why I, was, I thought it was more recent, but this was back in January. So yeah. not a time when you typically think of a horse having laminitis. No, but she had been eating a ton of hay. And you can see in, in some of these pictures, if you look in a couple of the pictures, she had kicked off one of her pads and she st stuck her foot on the edge of the rubber mat. It was one of your the yeah, other one pictures. Of the ones back here, yeah. And she did that by choice. And again, she stayed there. So in this bout, different nights I, I tried different things she really did not want there there she has she picked up her front foot took it off the pad and put it on to the rubber mat on the corner of the rubber mat and stood there for a while so she definitely knew what she needed way better than what I knew Yep, and it and so, so we were just using the firm slants. You had a pair already, and I brought you over the second pair. And this was like the third night when she started to stand really square again, and and we wanted a slant under all four feet. But every night it was a little bit different. Yes, and every night which foot she left on, by the about the fourth night, I think she kicked the hind feet off pretty quickly. She had really no interest in that. And then she would kick off one of her front feet and keep the other one there no matter what. I'd walk away, you know, go do something else. And she was not moving. And this is a horse that she certainly knows how to ground tie, but if you leave her loose in the barn, 
she goes over and explores the brush box and, and checks out the other stalls. He, she's not going to hang out. Right. She hung out. I could walk outside of the barn where she couldn't even see me and come in and she was still planted. Yeah, yeah that's where she there. there and just stood on that right front for a while. <laughs> yep. And she'd already removed the hind ones. Yep. So we've come to the end of an hour. That seemed to go by really fast. Um, and um, there's been a, let's see. Uh, this, um, there's just a couple of quick, quick question, questions. Um, you did not use the soft pads with her, but I don't think we have any soft pads for you to use. So we just use the firm slants. Um, yes, we, let's see. Let's see, do you recommend any herbs that you can use instead of regimate? That's a great question. Um, yes, for the mares that are having issues with cycling, there's a couple of different things that you can do. Um, there are, like Hilton Herb has a, a product called Easy Mare that's really good. And there's also a really cool natural um, hormone called Serene or Serene by Nature, which is on my website. And so we're using their bioidentical hormones, just like a lot of people, a lot of the alternative medicine practitioners for people are using bioidentical hormones. So you're not using Regimate, which is a synthetic, you're using, um, it's in the online store. Oh, okay. um, you're using um, a bioidentical hormone. And that for some of the mares has turned them around so that they um, don't. They don't even need to live on it. It's there on that um, that bottom or up in the top left corner right now. That to me is a really exciting product. And some of the mares that we've put on it for for a season, like the spring season, or sometimes for six months, actually it rebalances and, and helps their whole hormonal system. And it's not like you end up having to, uh, having to keep them on products. Um, and so somebody asked about raspberry leaves. Raspberry leaves can be helpful for some horses. Raspberry leaves by themselves, a lot of times are really not enough. If all you need is raspberry leaves, go for it by all means. What you'll see with a lot of herbs is that herbal, herbal medicine really is a formula type of medicine. And it's the combination and the synergy of everything working together that makes the most effective products. And the skill of the combination some products are going to be better than others because some of the herbalists or the people putting together the products have more training than others. So I always look at companies where their formulators have experience so that you're doing the most appropriate thing. But if an individual horse only responds and to a single herb or only needs a single herb, there's no reason at all not to do that. So we're coming to the end. We've been here for a little over an hour. I just, I didn't realize, Joyce, that you have Al on your homepage and it's really nice. There he is right there, his big cheery face. That's Al when he was first learning to fox hunt. Yeah. Um, well, and so- I had a couple of pictures that I could share on my screen. Sure, let me stop sc sh screen share over here. And I can- It feels like we could keep this conversation going for a long time. Uh, of course yeah. we have for 30 years. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So let's see. Okay, right now we have a black Three screen. Pictures. Oh, oh so there's that's just Al. some winter on. With, yep, there's Al with, with my horse. Yep, and there's and some more Al. Really Al, playing up in this By the way, Al eats twice as much as <laughs> the other horse. Exactly, twice as much. Yes, I pay double in hay. Oh, Andy there's that, that's a fabulous picture. So that was my Christmas present when you're from Brad. He got Joyce to take that picture. And um, of course, Joyce has Highlands. I was going to show a picture of Highlands and that's what's on her t-shirt. And, uh, and uh, 
She's a, and that was Elle saying hi to a bull. And yeah. that's a really sweet bull. But they had a little conversation. And there's a good African picture. Oh, yeah. Some, somewhere in there is a Wendy. I'm not quite sure where. It was taken from a very long ways away. Yep. All right, Joyce, so I think we're going to have to do this again. What do you think? Yeah, I think we should do this again. All right. So uh, we're going to sign off now. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. This has been great to have you with us and great questions to kind of that. And that's how these webinars are going, that, that they're rather informal. And um, some people I've known longer than others, obviously. And so we have more backstories. But, you know, it's really about what you're interested in and, um, and keeping things light while we're going through this uh, uh, time. Um, and we'll all come through the other end, but in the meantime, we're going to learn a lot. So thank you so much for joining us and thank you again, Joyce. And um, we'll, I'll get in touch so we can schedule another one of these webinars. Great. Thanks. Thanks for putting this together. It's a lot of fun, a lot of fun to share. Yep. Y'all take care, be safe and be well. Bye. <laughs>